for this diet from either the industry or for people who are eating them. And um, th that is, uh, there you see a piece of a snail dump at the top. You see a pot with a recognizable indigo shading on it, which held the dye. And at the bottom is a wonderful book by Dominique Cardon called Natural Dyes, not just about this dye, but about many other dyes that people uh, have used. And it's a book which describes not only the chemistry and biology, but also some of the So, this is the most prima facie evidence of this economic value. This is a coin, coin of the city of Tyre, Tyre, Sir in Arabic, which still exists. And this, what do you put in the coin? You put on one side a picture of the roller, on the other side you put some symbol. It's the same in American coins and anything else. Uh, so what they, uh, this is on the obverse of this coin, at the bottom is the foundation myth of the city of Tyre. And the foundation myth is Hercules' dog. It's a little sculpture three millimeters high. Hercules' dog, going along the beach, finds a snail, bites on it, and its snout is colored purple. That's how the story goes of how the Tyrian purple was discovered. And you see here a pretty good representation of the size of that murex snail. Um, and there are a number of other points that show this. Not only in the Mediterranean, but also in the Sea of Japan, around Indonesia, and around the coast, coast of South America, there are species of snails. And once again, I cannot forego the aesthetic pleasure of showing you some of those South American textiles. Uh, and I notice I've very carefully avoided the use of the word pre-Columbian that right away puts it into a colonialist tradition. These were very interesting civilizations because of what they mastered and what they didn't also. Uh, but the blue in these is from a snail in the goat. The same, not the same. A different species of snail. Come back to that. Meanwhile, all around the world, depending on the climate, there were growing regions for various species of plants that also produced the blue. The darkest two blues that you see here, and especially the part that you can see going over to India, is the indigo plant, which is in the bee family, um, indigo fera. Here's a field of indigo from California, where it goes to. And here is from a a masterpiece, an important marker in human civilization, European civilization. This is the first encyclopedia, Diderot and Alembert's Encyclopedie. And he's showing indigo vats as they were used then in India for the making, for the making of indigo. Uh, the light there blue, the lightest blue that you see going across all of China and across Europe and the British Isles and into southern Scandinavia was home to another plant. And this is Isatis tinctoria, looks very different, called in English woad, in German weid, and in French pastel. This is the source of our word pastel, which has entered other uses then. Both of these plants requiring some fermentation of different parts of the plant, not just the flowers, but the stalks and the leaves, lead to, uh, some, to a blue pigment. And that blue was encountered, for instance, by, we tend to think blue in the context of the UK as being blue-blooded, being an aristocrat. Here is what, where that blue comes from. This is, Julius Caesar meeting up some Britons, fighting them, primitive Britons, and they, they dye themselves with woad in order to frighten the enemy. That is the source of the, of the blue in that context. 
So what we have is a number of species of snails producing uh, that something which can be made into that blue by natural processes, and also a number of species of glands. If you are asking the question, what the heck are number of species of snails, as well as widely different plant representatives doing, making the same molecule? If you really ask that question, you are well on the way to becoming a scientist. Uh, that's the kind of question uh, which interests a lot of people. It turns out, of course, of course, there is something similar in our biochemistry of all of these things. I could make indigo from you, except it would not be a very efficient process. I would have to take a lot your blood in order to make indigo from you. So this doesn't remove the question entirely, but the point is that one half of the indigo molecule, I haven't shown you the molecule yet, but one half of the indigo molecules related to a common organic molecule called indo. And that half in turn comes from the breakdown of uh, one of the essential amino acids, which is called tryptophan. And everything from E. coli on up has this stuff in it. So the real question, once you realize that, it's actually part of our shared heritage. And it's no surprise at all that all of them good. The real question is, why do some organisms overproduce it? or express it, or overexpress it. This is the kind of question which our late colleague and friend for many of us, Tom Eisner, was especially interested in. I assure you that the catnip plant does not make catnip for our use, right? So it's in the same way. What purpose do these snails uh, have for producing this molecule? And that is not yet known actually, as far as I know. So there are many interesting biological questions about the evolutionary advantage to various organisms of these particular. Uh, now, the, I didn't mention, but I will as I go forward, that the snails make both the blue and the reddish end of this range of colors, but the plant material can only be used to make the blue, when it properly died, makes only the blue range of the colors. The dyer's art can mix another pigment in to make a red, which makes a very good match for any purple that you have in between. Eventually, finally, Cultural evolution catches up with natural evolution. And this is cultural evolution. This is chemistry. And these are samples from one of the great science museums of the first uh, aniline dyes produced by the BASF company in Germany. So the story here is a story of chemical industry and invention, a dye produced in England by Interestingly, an English student, Perkin, of a German professor teaching in London, August Wilhelm von Hoffmann, uh, much like Haydn was hired in London, Hoffmann is hired in London to teach chemistry and not music a hundred years later. And uh, he, he, the beginnings of the dye stuff industry are in England, but the Germans run away. And the uh, growing German industry makes these things very quickly. Here is a letter from a great chemist, uh, Adolf von Bayer, to Heinrich Caro, the head of the BASF company. BASF is one of the three, what used to be three major German chemical companies. Uh, and this is the only one that survived as a chemical company. He tells him that he has the formula of indigo in 1883. 
And uh, within seven years, BASF has an industrial production of the synthetic indigo, which puts the plant indigo industry out of business in the British Empire and elsewhere, uh, slowly out of business. Uh, this is sort of interesting. This is a label from, uh, from BASF's selling indigo. Why are they putting an exotic scene? For obvious reasons. Because they want to sell it. So let me tell you another story. In 1700 to 1710, Europeans in Meissen in Germany, in Saxony, produced for the first time an equivalent of Chinese porcelain, an article of great, great value. The Chinese had guarded the secret of porcelain, which involved a particular clay kaolin and a high firing temperature. Both were available independently in Europe, but was not rediscovered. Uh, and what did they do in terms of the designs that they put on the first European porcelain? Of course they put Chinese and Japanese designs on it, because that's what would sell. And that's part of the story that's going on here, is the product was exotic from the tropics, you make it look exotic when you want to sell it. And it took a long time to get away from that. Finally, a molecule sneaking up on you. On you. So here is dibromoindigo. You see the bromines at the ends, the bromine is present in large amounts in seawater, large amounts, relatively large amounts in seawater. It's present in tiny, tiny amounts on earth and plants. Uh, Israel's major pharmaceutical, major chemical company is called Brom. There's a reason for that, because they made many things with bromine from Dead Sea sources initially. Uh, this is the dibromo indigo with just the hydrogens there, instead of the bromine, this is indigo by itself. Uh, I, the, the, it's fairly sure that the Tyrian purple, let's see if I have the major colors here. No, I don't. The Tyrian purple that the Romans used was probably a mixture of indigo and dibromo indigo. And there can be chemistries that move among those, natural and synthetic. Also, there is a gender difference between the snails producing some indigo and some dibromo indigo. And then, as I told you, they change gender. So things become very interesting and very complicated. Uh, there is still a discussion going on what is the tekelet that is used in uh, Jewish ritual use. And perhaps Baruch will say something about that. Um, there. Eventually, chemical industry comes in. This is just the symbol for big production. That's all it says. <laughs> and eventually, a lot of indigo is put out. Enough to do what? Enough to do this. Yeah. <laughs> this is sacrilege, so I immediately take it off. You <laughs> do that. Um, but what, let me, let me explain it in words. There are two billion pairs of genes made every year in the last few years around the world, mostly in China. It takes one to three grams of indigo to dye a pair of blue genes. Yes, that's the blue color of blue genes. Most of it is immediately washed out for fashion reasons. But the, an estimate has been made uh, that if the that number of genes had to be dyed from plant indigo sources, that it, uh, indigo plants would cover every arable inch of the world to a depth of 10 feet. So if you are wearing blue jeans, I want you to be grateful for chemistry. That's <laughs> the purpose of showing these slides. Now, the purpose of showing that is that with the exception of what we'll hear, of hear about Tilda Helen, the synthetic indigo is so inexpensive and matches so well the blue end of the range that the plant indigo industry 
industry, commercial industry, is lost around the world, with one exception, and that is Japan, where there is a viable commercial plant indigo industry. I'm wearing a tie from the industry made, and here, and here uh, you can see a kimono fabric in that a very dark indigo shade, but as you can see from the tie, it can also be a lighter shade as well. So, what is remarkable about Japan is not that they can make CDs and cars better than we can. It's that they can do so while maintaining their cultural traditions. You can see that for yourself if you go to Japan as a tourist or otherwise, and you go into that pinnacle of Japanese cultural uh, achievement, which is a Japanese department store. They are there in major cities. Seven, eight floors. Uh, there are little girls at the entrance greeting you with a certain kind of ritual greetings. There are, to be sure, two floors with electronics and three floors with all the latest brands of men's and women's clothes. But there will be a floor, usually the sixth or seventh floor, which sells these things, and which is also where art galleries are, and where ceramics are, and it's always there. There is no department store that does not have a sixth floor like that. And that is part of the story. So there is enough of a cultural tradition demanding that the kimonos worn at weddings, and at other times, I have a pajamas as well as this tie, <laughs> that those fabrics be made, dyed with planted oil. And it's strong enough so that the industry persists. I don't know of anywhere else in the world where it's maintained except as a craft tradition. Uh, here is the range of the purples I wanted to show you, the range of the blue to the purple that I wanted to show you again. And now, actually, that was the input to the dye. Uh, it is a little bit of chemistry, but don't pay any attention to it. Um, there is a reference for somebody wants about the ancient industry. We know a lot about it from the work of a molecular archaeologist at the uh, University of Pennsylvania Museum, Patrick McGovern, who is very good. So, what happens is this. I told you that the dye is not good enough as a dye to dye a fabric. So, dyeing is a very complicated thing, and, and there are different procedures, which I don't have time to tell you, for preparing a fabric to receive a dye, so that the dye is impregnated into the fabric. And what's happening is neither in the protein-based wool, nor in the cellulose-based uh, cotton or linen, is the molecule of indigo absorbed sufficiently, it's over here, into the dye. And so what you have to do is you have to do a transformation of that dye into another molecule, not too far, because you destroy what is called the chromophore, the thing that gives it color. You keep the general picture of the dye, but actually all you do is you add two hydrogen. That form is colorless. And then in that form, and as a result of those OH groups, it forms a stronger bond with the wool with, or the cellulose, the protein cellulose. And now you have to reverse the process. So it's formed a bond. But the thing that gives it color is still there, but it's got to be sort of unveiled. And that last part is very, very easy. I'm desperately trying to avoid the chemical words reduction and oxidation. <laughs> but the first process is called reduction, and the second part process is called oxidation. And the reason it's called oxidation is because initially, and in this case, it is reaction with the oxygen of the atmosphere. That is what causes the oxidation. So as you take it out of the solution, which has made it colorless, and allow it to interact with oxygen, it turns blue before your eyes. 
to show this to you. And Baruch has it in the video. But there's a little bit about the chemistry. Today we would do it with modern reagents. But ancient world, there was no reliable source of what to use as the reduction agent. There was oxygen. That's not the problem. It's the it's what you have. So here is the description from a Stockholm papyrus. It's called Stockholm papyrus, not because it wasn't written in Stockholm, because that's where it's resident in the library. And it says, put a talent of woad. It's dealing with a plant material in a tube. Stands in the sun. Then pour urine in until the liquid rises over the woad and let it be warmed by the sun. But on the following day, get the woad ready so you can tread around it in the sun until it becomes well moistened. One must do this, however, for three days together. Some of the prescriptions say that the urine is best if it was produced by men having drunk strong drink, which was not difficult to generate in old days. <laughs> just, so you, just so you think this is, this is uh, stuff that's not Jewish, in the Talmud, there is among the analytical chemistry for testing whether you have the correct helen or the plant dyed material. Here we get 40 days, except there is some dispute about this 40 day old urine. Uh, and there, I think there is a, a description that it's a 40 day child or something like that. It doesn't matter. Urine is a great natural product, available in great abundance. Uh, if you go to a dyer's market in even modern-day Morocco, you will see, uh, you, will, you will smell it. And uh, it was there in, uh, there are dyer's vats outside in, uh, uh, in, uh, in Italy uh, as well. You can see them in old sites. Uh, the, um, when it comes out, it's acidic. It turns basic after a few times. But it wasn't the only source. And uh, the, uh, what you need is what an alkali, a base, to get the reduction for. And uh, the other common base in antiquity, aside from old urine, was potash. Potash was ashes. If you boil up ashes, they're alkaline. And that was used also in the making of soap in ancient times. So there's another technology, very interesting one, going with just ashes. Uh, next slide. I have to move this myself. I'm standing in a dive pit in Teldor, uh, uh, I think, right? Uh, where the, I think the mountains turn into the sea south of Haifa. Eventually, there is now a modern site, but it was a Phoenician dye site. And I'm, uh, I have got, I've caught one of the snails. <laughs> now, what am I doing doing this? Well, I had written a book with a younger member of the Leibowitz family, Shira Leibowitz. I was writing it at the time. We were doing research for the book. And as you can see, the research was very hard. Um, and the, uh, we were, this book is now, uh, so this book did not say that the code to the future of the universe was in the Torah, nor did it say that everything in the Bible is a pack of lies. Therefore, it did not sell. <laughs> <laughs> This book is out of print, but you can buy copies on the web dirt cheap. I buy my time. When it goes to one cent, I buy it. And I have one copy here, which I'll be willing to sell for more. Shira, there's a picture of Shira. So there's a story. Shira's observant, of course, so she didn't go in the water with us, and I and her sons went in the water there, and uh, we are holding two of the three species of snails, and they are there. But we couldn't use them to make the color because they're protected in Israel. And uh, you'll be told where the snails that are used to make the color come from. You notice we're smiling. Now, 
this was very important because we have just written a book. I can show you the book. And inside the front and back cover of the book, there's usually a picture of the author, so something like that. So, and it's usually nice if the authors look either profound or smiling. Two choices in general. So here there were two authors and there was no picture of us both smiling. Those of you who collaborated on a book will know why. <laughs> and here was a picture where we were both smiling. So I said, Shira, that's the picture for the book. And she said, wait, I have to see my rabbi. <laughs> so, I began to wonder, I thought it was my nipples. <laughs> Violet, Violet, Steel, here. But no, it wasn't my nipple, it was my fair legs. <laughs> and after we cut off my legs, we used this. We got the <laughs> So here is a younger Baro and a younger me in standing in a Phoenician diamond and duplicating the process. It was a wonderful moment. Thank you, Baro, for, for making that possible. It was very special. One of the things these three young guys said, they were young then, um, is uh, they all had gone to Yeshiva University. I mean, and uh, what they said was, I wish we had paid more attention to the chemistry course we had to take. <laughs> Because here they were doing chemistry, and uh, to a varying degree they had avoided it. But now they couldn't avoid it. And it was, but that was not the major part of the story. So what we're doing, we're standing and reproducing the process, no, with modern chemicals as a reducing agent. And he may tell you a little bit more, but if he doesn't in a question period, I will tell you what problem they have now. There is no question in my mind nor in the mind of leading scientific authorities, Jewish scientific authorities, if you want them, but who cares? Scientific authorities that these formerly young people that you saw in the company did to Helen have rediscovered to Helen. There is no doubt at all, but that's not their problem. Their problem, in a sense, is in this in this passage and in further Kabbalistic texts, uh, and that is that the loss of the blue, the loss of the blue, God identified throughout the ages with the Messiah not being here. And they've got a problem, especially in the Christian time. Um, and that is, uh, so he, he, he will not tell you about the problem, but I will. I'm an outsider. There is no central Jewish religious agency, the authority. And what they have to do is they have to convince rabbi by rabbi, group by group, that this stuff should be used. And that's, that's a much, much harder task than making the ticket. And I admire them for undertaking that task. And if you can help them, uh, well, that's what we're doing. But the reason they, they're they also doing a lot of interesting things. Maybe he'll tell you, but he can't brag too much. But I'll just tell you one thing that they are doing. Through the Tehillet story, they are in, in introducing Haredi kids to biology. And that is a major achievement that can be done for a number of, of different reasons. Yes, even more impressive. So here they are, and all I have, I have, I don't have a good picture. Baruch will provide me one. I wanted a picture of the stuff turning blue before my eyes. Well, it is. You just have to imagine the blue at the top. <laughs> what we're doing is taking out. I think it was wool, but I'm not sure. I skein a wool, a wool out of this mixture, and what I want you to imagine. And you don't have to be religious to do so, I'm not. In fact, on Wednesday I'm having a discussion with a, a 
Veritas, the Christian Forum, where I'm billed as an atheist chemist discussing with a Christian geneticist. I should have made you guess who was who. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, and this, we're discussing uh, atoms, molecules, is that everything there is to life. Anyway, uh, you don't have to be religious to understand the incredible faith, first of all, that you have to have to see something precious. 10,000 snails to make a few grams of the diet that the day is To have that blue disappear in Europe or something like that. And to have the faith, religious, scientific, perhaps, which to have the faith that it would reappear and wouldn't just be flushed down the drain. And then, when you actually see it before your eyes, you take it out and it turns blue before your eyes. That is a truly a spiritual moment. And on that I want to end the story. This is going to be about three minutes of taking you through the entire process of making of making chaylet from uh,
uh, chemical uh, uh, ideas or, or, or some uh, experimentation that must have gone on in the 3,000 years of shellfish dying that must have come up with different ways of doing it. Uh, you could turn that beautiful purple dye into a magnificent blue dye. And both of these were enormously expensive in ancient times, right? Um, up to 20 times their weight in gold. And both are mentioned uh, in the ancient sources. And they were both very, very, very much admired uh, and um, desired, very, very valuable. And yet, there is a slight difference in cultural appreciation for the two different colors. It would appear that to the rest of the world, it was really the purple that was more desired, right? I have, uh, I may have to look down once in a while for some quotes. Uh, the toga picta, right, was a purple toga that only the generals could wear when they were coming back triumphant. This is in, in, ancient, uh, in ancient Rome and Greece. Only the generals, the triumphant general, could come back and wear this beautiful purple toga that was uh, adorned with gold. And so Pliny, uh, Pliny writes, it brightens every garment, the purple, and shares with gold the glory of the tribe. For these reasons, we must pardon the mad desire for purple. And to this day, actually, you can find this partiality to purple in those who kind of kept the tradition of the ancient Roman fashion sense in the ecclesiastical garb of the Catholic Church, which is basically red. Yet to the Jews, this was not the case. And in the Bible, when we read about in the tabernacle and the, uh, the temple, for example, list of precious commodities that we use in the temple, and they're always listed in order, the most precious to the lowest. So when it lists the precious metals, gold and silver and bronze, whenever it lists the fabrics, it always says techelet v'argaman and tolad shani. First techelet blue and afterwards argaman, which we believe was purple, the dye Roma went to go, and then the tolad shani, which was a crimson. And then you also have the high priest who wore a special set of clothes, very magnificent magnificent embroidery, and he had a a, um, eel, a coat, which was all tchelet. So tchelet was, it seems, the most desired and the most beautiful of the colors of the Jews, as opposed to the purple in the rest of the world. And I don't have indigo pajamas or an indigo tie, but I do have a thread of snail indigo on my, uh, on my seat, which I wear, of course, all the time. And, um, and this is a beautiful, beautiful color. And the question that I have to ask is, what is it about blue that made the Jews choose that hue? I guess if I was wrapping that would be come out a little bit better. <laughs> well, I want to consider something, and since this is an evening of science and religion, I'd like to talk about uh, one of the greatest, maybe the greatest scientist of all time, uh, who actually was religious as well. I'm talking about Isaac Newton. Now, Isaac Newton, uh, let me quote from the, uh, the biography, a wonderful biography of James, that James Good wrote about Isaac Newton. You see, we don't, because Newton was such a great scientist, invented optics, invented celestial mechanics, mechanics in general, we don't appreciate that Newton was also a tremendous and innovative mathematician. And in fact, maybe you could even argue that some of his contributions to mathematics were even you know, more important than his contributions to science, per se. He, he had an amazing insight that revolutionized mathematics. And that was his willingness, his radical and provocative willingness to contend with the notion of infinity. And this is James Newton. He relished the infinite as Descartes had not. That's a quote that I'll have from my, uh, the topic, my title. We should
should never enter into arguments about the infinite, Descartes had written. For since we are finite, it would be absurd for us to determine anything concerning the infinite. For this would be to attempt to limit it, grasp it. So we shall not bother to reply to those who ask if half an infinite line would itself be infinite, or whether an infinite number is odd or even and so on. It seems, said Descartes, that nobody has any business to think about such matters unless he regards his own mind as infinite. Yet it turns out, concludes Glick, that the human mind, though bounded in a nutshell, can discern the infinite and take its measure. And so Newton contemplated infinities, the infinitely large, summing infinite series that go on and on forever, and especially the infinitely small, the infinitesimal, and so he invented what one could argue is the most important mathematical tools of calculus. And that was an innovation, a radical innovation. And I'd like to just point out and talk about one more radical innovation which has to do with Abraham, whose escapades we've been following over the last few weeks in the weekly cover portion. He also had a radical, innovative, provocative, and world-changing paradigm shift. And that is that Abraham rejected paganism and proposed this new way of belief, religious belief, which is monotheism, belief in one God. Essentially, at its core, paganism constrained the gods. It sought to quantify their sphere of influence, their powers, their jurisdictions. Abraham recognized that there is one God, omniscient, omnipotent, and in all ways essentially infinite. But the most radical idea that Abraham put forth was that man, finite being that he is and not a particularly <coughs> impressive one, can have a relationship with an infinite God. We read this week, I, Abraham said, who am but dust, here I am speaking to God. And that is actually a phenomenally radical idea. And in essence, Judaism believes that man, finite, constrained, and limited, can indeed have a relationship with you. And that's why I believe that Tchelet was so important to the Jewish people. I have a quote from the great Russian artist, Vasily Kandinsky. Kandinsky, and Kandinsky was very interesting. He had a very fascinating neurological disorder called synesthesia, where he heard color. He experienced color as sound, and vision had a, uh, a musical aspect to it. Kandinsky writes, the darker and the deeper blue gets, the more it calls man to infinity, making him long for the pure and finally the ultimately sensitive. The designer, Yves Klein, loved blue. He actually patented a specific shade of blue called IKB, International Klein Blue. Everybody wears it, they have to pay royalties to be blue. He has uh, a quote, one of his books, where he writes about something which can only be uh, termed a religious experience. He writes, as I lay stretched upon the beach at Nice, I began to feel hatred for the birds which flew back and forth across my blue sky, cloudless sky, because they tried to bore holes in my greatest and most beautiful world. Klein got lost in the infinity of the blue sky, and he hated the birds for bringing him back to reality, for reminding him of his finitude, of his distance from the sky, and from the fact that he could never really touch it. The birds knew what Klein 
didn't want to admit. It wasn't really his stuff. I have a quote that I just looked up. Has anybody read the new book by Oliver Sacks, The Mind's Eye? Okay, Oliver Sacks talks about, in this book, his experimentation with hallucinogenic drugs. Back, I guess, uh, in the 60s or 70s. And he, I, I just looked this up because I found it so interesting to, 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 to read. One sunny Saturday in 1964, says I developed a pharmacological launch pad consisting of a base of amphetamines for general arousal, LSD for hallucinogenic intensity, and a touch of cannabis for a little added delirium. Talk about chemistry. <laughs> about 20 minutes after taking this, I faced a white wall and exclaimed, I want to see indigo now, now. And then, as if thrown by a giant paper, there appeared a huge, trembling, pear-shaped blob of the purest indigo. Luminous, numinous, it filled me with rapture. It was the color of heaven. The color, I thought, that Giotto spent a lifetime trying to get but never achieved. Never achieved. Perhaps because the color of heaven is not to be seen on earth. And then it disappeared, leaving me with an overwhelming sense of loss and sadness that it had been snatched away. And he goes on to say that for years and years and years, he went on looking all over for that indigo. And he concludes, that was 47 years ago, and I have never seen indigo again. The book that my wife and I wrote, The Rarest Blue, was translated into Hebrew recently, and it was called with Om Tehashamayim, Taste the sky. And that phrase comes from a Liberian legend of a young mother who eats too much of the sky, and that can be very dangerous. The gods punish her with the tragic death of her baby daughter, but as a con consolation, they teach her the secret of blue dyeing so that she can in turn share it with others, and so people can hold and touch the sky in some small measure and some lesser measure. And this notion trying to grasp that which is impossible to grasp. You see, Tchayat signified to the Jew that he could have a relationship with the Yifu. By holding the Tchayat strings in his hand, as he said the words, Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Yechad. The Lord God is one one in the sense of unique, one in the sense of infinite. As we say in the Yiddah prayer, the ein yachid ki God is one, like there is no other one. Ne'elam, transcendent. God means so and infinite. You see, you can have a mad lust for purple, you can really, really love red, but in blue, it's that's what Kempinski felt. He's blind, and that's what Oliver Sacks was trying to do in those wonderful episodes, I guess. And that's what the Jew tries to do when he looks at the Tchelet Street. I'll just end with one idea, you know. Somebody who wasn't mentioned today, but really deserves to be. Not, by the way, everybody who really, thank you so much for coming here, and everybody who helped to prepare this, especially to Robert Fitzin, to the JLIC, to the Ithaca Jewish community, and Hillel, and Binghamton, and thank you so much, all of you, for, for coming out, to the, uh, to the boys who helped set up. Thank you very much. But there's another person that should be mentioned, and that's a Hasidic rabbi who lived in the late 1800s. Gershon Hennepalami. We'll talk about him in the book. Very amazing, amazing man. And he went out in search of Tchelet from his home in Poland, traveled all the way across the European continent, Naples, Italy, to try and figure out what this lost Tchelet was. And he has just a word, and I want to say what he 
It says, you know, that in Judaism there's this notion that we try to imitate God. God is merciful, so we should be merciful. God is, uh, is uh, gracious, God is kind, so too we should be. Imitatio Dei, to imitate God. Said the Razina Rebbe, so too, just as God is infinite, so too we should be. He said, you know there's frustrations that we all have in life. We have these frustrations because we feel constrained physically, emotionally, intellectually. We want to accomplish, we want to do, we want to know, we want to have, and yet we can't. We can't have all of that, we can't do all of that, we can't be all of that. And yet, and these Hasidic Rebbe's had such profound psychological insight. He said, you know, often those constraints are really self-imposed. You know, we tell ourselves, oh, I'm not that kind of person, I'm no good at that. And we believe it because, maybe because we're afraid to put the effort in, we're afraid to try, we're afraid to risk. But really, if we could and if we believed in ourselves, we could do so much more, we could be so much more. The Tchelet said the Ratzin Rebbe hangs at the edge of your garment, at the corner of your clothes, where you end, right? This is where we're comfortable, inside of our clothes. And it hangs just at the edge, where you stop and the rest of the world is there, and then it continues on. Beyond your limitations, beyond your constraints, beyond what you believe possible, because it tells you that you should believe that more is possible, and that you're capable of so much more. Just like God is infinite, so too we can be. And the beautiful blue of the infinite sky and the infinite sea is what beckons us to be more. And that is what allows us to have a relationship with the infinite by coming into taps and by looking at the infinite within ourselves. Thank you all so, so, so much for coming out.